This is a News Channel 5 Decision 2016 special, The Congressional Debate. Good evening, I'm Michael Williams and welcome to the debate for Congressional District 18 covering Martin St. Lucie and parts of Palm Beach County. It's a politically diverse area and we have much to talk about tonight. In fact, let's look at how diverse it is. On the screen, 38% Republican, 35% Democrat, 27% say they're either independent or have no party affiliation, and we are represented across the political spectrum tonight. Joining us, the Republican candidate, Mr. Brian Mast, United States Army combat veteran, explosive bomb disposal expert specialist, a former specialist with the Department of Homeland Security, a volunteer at one point, Israeli Defense Forces as well. Randy Perkins, the Democrat, the owner and founder of Ashbrit. Back in 1992, he founded it, a disaster recovery company that has done work nationwide, former owner and founder of Regional Landscaping Company, former employee of Yellow Freight System Incorporated. And Carla Spalding, our independent, no party affiliation, a master in nursing, specialty in education, former nurse, the Veterans Regional Medical Center, served in the United States Navy from 1987 to 1991. We welcome all of our candidates. A few notes, this will be a conversation. There's no fixed times for discussion. It's not a formal debate in that sense. We want our candidates to talk with each other, to talk with you about issues important to you in terms of your pocketbook, the environment, and more. I will try to keep them on track as best I can as the moderator and cover as many topics as we can over the next hour. Many of you have said you're tired of the back and forth and the name calling, not only in this campaign at times, but in campaigns across the state and the nation. We'll do the best we can with our candidates to stay focused on the issues. We will begin with one that was central to the concerns for so many in Congressional District 18 over the summer, and that was the algae crisis. The powerful incoming Florida Senate President, Joe Negron, has a proposal to eventually spend $2.4 billion and buy land south of Lake Okeechobee. Essentially, environmentalists are almost uniformly unified in saying we need to send the water south it would envision eventually buying 60,000 acres south of the lake to create a reservoir, eventually cleaning the water out of Lake Okeechobee and moving it south. It's not the only answer to the algae crisis this summer, but it may be one. Mr. Mast, do you support that plan? And you and I have been on record with this before. I absolutely support Senator, uh, State Senator Joe Negron's plan for buying 60,000 or more acres of land south of Lake Okeechobee. And I look forward to working to get the resources for that as, uh, as the next member of Congress, the next Water Resources and Development Act, hopefully. Mr. Perkins, you've been less supportive of it. Why? Well, listen, I think, first of all, what I, what I will want to look at is real solutions. Um, and you know, I believe that the, the proposal that Senator Negron is putting through is just not going to pass uh, the legislature with other members of, of the state of, of the state of Florida. Um, we do need to send some of this water south. I do support that. Uh, however, I want to look at uh, real solutions and, and not solutions that just don't stand a chance of, of happening. Well, with respect, is it reason not to try? He'll be the most powerful Florida lawmaker, the incoming Florida Senate president. He says we have Amendment 1 money passed a few years ago to help pay for this and that we need to try. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with environmentalists to say ultimately we must send water south of the lake? I agree with environmentalists that we have to use, part of the solution is sending water south. But we have to remember that Amendment 1 money was just not for buying land south uh, of Lake Okeechobee. This was passed throughout the entire state of Florida with other members in, in the Panhandle and Jacksonville, uh, Tampa, Orlando, Daytona that have their own issues that they need addressed. So collectively, it was passed. That amendment was to provide some money, uh, but not all of that money was, was meant to go for buying land south, south of the lake. Ms. Spalding, your support? or not for Joe Negron's plan? Well, I think it varies. I think that, as I've said to you before, that this has been an ongoing problem for over 30 years. And if we really want to fix the problem, it would have been fixed already. It comes around when it's time for election, and that's when we tr start addressing the problem. Now, buying land will have to bring all the people, or all the parties to the table. We need to make sure that the owners, agriculture, and the sugar industry are willing to sell the land. But bottom line, do you support the plan as he envisions it and will present it to the Florida legislature? I haven't read all the plan, but if it, as I'm saying, if it does not include all the parties being at the table, it's a waste of time. But obviously he has said it will include all of those parties. The question is, will there be the political will which brings up the issue, you and I have talked about this, Mr. Mast, as the Republican candidate, 
and you've seen this in campaign ads as well. You did take money from Big Sugar at one point. Uh, according to the figures, either between 12800 or 15500 You say you're not beholden to Big Sugar. Explain to our audience why you're not. I certainly am not beholden to the sugar industry or any other industry. I made a very conscious choice to give them back uh, their contributions, and uh, that's the end of it. I gave them back their money. Um, now, my opponent and I, we have been at odds over this issue numerous times, and we recently had a, uh, a forum at the Nettles, Island, uh, the Nettles Island Forum, and he came out and said something very disturbing at that forum. He came out and said that he had done an extensive amount of work for the sugar mills, and I would pose you this question, just how many millions of dollars have you made off the sugar industry when you've been spending millions of dollars on an election to try to hit me over a couple thousand dollars that I gave back to them? Mr. Perkins? Well, first of all, it wasn't a couple thousand dollars. For my opponent to say he went to a billionaire's mansion uh, uh, for a fundraiser and claims he didn't know You're where the money was. talking to the, the, the fan hills, correct. Uh, that he didn't know where the money was coming from. He said he sent back the money, he didn't send back the money. The paper, the TC poem, actually said it took him three times. He said it, and he didn't. But the fact of the matter is I've been very transparent from day one in this race, from the minute I got in this race, that I have known the Fan Hools and I've known Robert Koger for many years. You're talking I, about the people at U.S. Sugar, Florida U.S. Sugar, and U.S. Sugar and Florida Crystals, correct. And I've done work for them. I know them. I've been very trans uh, transparent. We provided a service. They paid us, uh, uh, they paid us to do that work. Uh, however, I've also said... How much did they pay you? We've done work for them over the years, and they've been very good to us. How good? Uh, I'm sorry? How good? Uh, we provided services. We've probably done several million dollars worth of work for them over the years. Cannot the same question be asked for a different reason? Does that business relationship not make it more likely Ab that absolutely. you would be beholden to Big absolutely Sugar? Absolutely not. I would look at it more that I have a relationship with them. I've said this from day one. Uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot get anything done to solve this problem if you can't work together with all parties. Sugar absolutely has a role in helping solve this problem. Are you willing to go to Big Sugar? I'll put the question to all sure, three please. of you because Ms. Spalding, you brought it up. Yes. Uh, you said that we have to get all parties involved. Absolutely. Then that means you have to be willing to go to agricultural absolutely. interest and say you may need to sell that land or otherwise we're going to have to find ways to buy it. Are you willing to press on that issue to go push to buy that land when Big Sugar and other agricultural interests have argued that's not the answer. How hard are you willing to push when by your own acknowledgement you say you're not fully versed on that issue? Well, I'm the only one that has absolutely nothing to do with the sugar industry. Um, I owe nobody anything other than the people. Now, yes, without, and I'll say it again, without them being involved one way or the other, either they say yes, we're willing to sell a portion of the land, or no, so in that way, we can make another decision. Are you willing to go to court, should they say no? Imminent domain, some have suggested? Whatever it takes. What? Listen, we have a problem that's been going on for several years, decades. We have to have a solution, a viable solution. If it means that, yes, because it's for the people. We have to. We have no choice. You've talked about other solutions. Mr. Mast, in the mosaic, the tapestry, really, that will involve a lot of solutions. Certainly sending the water south is one that environmentalists argue is important, but not the only one. What are other solutions concretely that as a freshman legislator, should you win a seat in the House, you could effectively push for, really, in the first two years? How would you do that? Other issues related uh, other to other issues or? related to the water crisis. Before we move on, so again, it's working to get resources to this area, and specifically I think, how uh, some of the the good programs that we could work to fund would be uh, further water farming, uh, things like the Calkins Water Farm, making sure that we work towards things like constructed floating wetlands, uh, other ways to work towards some great infrastructure to get many of the 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 homes that are along these rivers and waterways off of septic and onto sewer. These are certainly programs that we could look to move the dial on. Mr. Perkins, I saw you shaking your well, head. I mean, what it, other parts of the solution well, are, are you willing and able to push it's, for? It's interesting that he signs all these forms from these different organizations that their only solution is to acquire and take the land from sugar. I do not support that. Uh, let's go back to we have tens of thousand acres that we already own north of the lake. We need to utilize those pr projects, reservoirs, mm -hmm. water farming, water storage projects. We have secondary runoff in, uh, in this district that doesn't even have anything to do with water coming from uh, uh, from, uh, from the lake. We have to utilize the necessary land south uh, for, these, uh, for these projects that, that, are, that we talk about of potentially constructing on, on agriculture land. But if, if agriculture was to hand over 100,000 acres tomorrow, hypothetically, and then we had a magic wand and we construct out all the projects that you need to do on those projects overnight, you still have to finish the countless projects that we have on the table 
projects that are, aren't even uh, app approved yet that still need to be funded because you have to convey the water to get there to begin with. So it's, it's a multiple prong approach and this one stop solution uh, that sugar is the, their land is, is, uh, is the only avenue is just, is just not correct. It's, just, it's not going to get anything Brief, done. Briefly, national candidates uh, and frankly the national media was criticized for not bringing up a topic that's of paramount interest to Florida and that's climate change. Do you believe that man is involved in helping create climate change? First you, Mr. Perkins, and how do you tackle that? Listen, I clearly, I clearly believe that we have climate change and global, global warming issues. You know, I spent a lot of time. Do you believe in the man's water. involved in helping create that? I'm sorry. Do you believe part of that is man-made climate change? Sure. I think, I think that there's uh, issues going on not only all around the world that's contributing to this problem. It's clear. I mean, scientists, science backs that up. Ms. Spalding. I would have to say that it depends. Uh, we'll have to do the research. Research. What research has been? Re done. If research has shown that it's man, man because of man then we'll have to do more research into that because I have no proof myself to know that it is because we're causing So right it. now you're skeptical about yes. whether there's a man-made component to climate change. Correct. I would Mr. have Mast? to do more. I am a firm believer in uh, that anthropogenic climate change exists uh, and I would encourage Ms. Spalding to look at some of the dendrionic research uh, surrounding that. That's basically the tree ring data that, that says, you know, if a tree ring is this large, then it means there was more carbon dioxide soaked up by that tree, uh, ultimately inferring how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. That's one of the things that they use. So I would encourage you to check out that sort of research. Yeah, but they're talking about man-made. And anthropogenic and climate change means man-made climate change. South. Let me ask you, all three of you, correct me if I'm wrong, on All Aboard Florida, the transit system that would move Miami to West Palm Beach, no stops on the Treasure Coast to Orlando, all of you are in opposition to that. Is that correct? That is correct. That's correct. And briefly, why? Uh, look, I don't think you can allow uh, All Aboard Florida to disrupt whether it's the quality of life or the safety of life throughout the Treasure Coast, and that's why I'm staunchly opposed to it. And yet, just a moment ago, on a huge issue that you said you believe in, climate change, certainly you can argue in a state of nearly 20 million people with more to come that mass transit will have to be one of the answers to getting vehicles perhaps millions over the years off the road and dealing with climate change so where is the leadership saying on the one hand I believe in man-made climate change but on the other hand at least one possible solution to deal with it I don't support uh, and, and I wouldn't look at mass transit from Miami to Orlando as the solution to, to no, man-made no. climate change no no but every every community think globally act locally, every community has a role in that. So speak to you the could, dichotomy there of a decision on the one hand saying I believe in it, but a mass transit option, I don't. I don't look at this, that as the mass transit option, the high speed train that's meant mm -hmm. to deliver people from the south all the way to, to Orlando. I don't look at that as being the type of, uh, the type of program that's meant to eliminate that many, ro that many cars from the roadway. And another thing that we should point out with All Aboard Florida is that it's not just about mass transit on the highway. It's about, uh, greatly about increased freight across uh, the breadth of Florida and across the Treasure Coast. And it's that that I think most of us have been in a lot of agreement on to say that, that we should be very concerned about what that freight is that's going through the Treasure Coast. Ms. Spalding, comment? Um, with All Aboard Florida, um, from the research that I've done, it shows that pretty much all the way up to West Palm Beach is pretty much a done deal. Um, we can say all we want to say, but we know that it, it is. Moving forward, um, as a community, we can do all we can to try to stop it, fight it, but we have to figure out what are we going to do if it does occur. I want to move on to a different topic area now, something that has been very much in the news of late. We'll begin with you, Mr. Perkins, as the Democratic candidate here. The Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, in Florida alone, as I pull the numbers, they're looking at 19% increases for those under the Affordable Care Act, what they will pay in premiums. Private insurers are jumping out of the program mm -hmm. saying it is not cost effective for them and that uh, they simply cannot afford to be part of this. In other states, you're looking at premiums even higher than that. As the Democratic candidate here, do you first in the main, then we'll get into the details, do you support the Affordable Care Act? Well, first of all, I support the fact that, that it, prov it provided insurance for millions of Americans with family and loved ones with pre-existing conditions. It provided millions of Americans who didn't have insurance, insurance. It allowed young, our younger generation to stay on their parents' insurance uh, it'll, uh, up to the age 26. There was also provisions that some of, uh, some of them could stay through their companies up to, the, uh, up to the age of 30. What I do support is taking the things that are working in it and keeping those in place and strengthening what those. What do we change then in Obamacare? 
we have to look at the things that aren't working. There are clearly numerous things in, in Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, that aren't working and that to be fixed. Chief among them? Well, listen, obviously, obviously the, the exchanges are leaving, uh, leaving our states. The, the rates are going up uh, substantially. Uh, you know, companies like mine, our insurance rates have gone up 32 percent in, in the last two years. But what we have to do is, is that we have to understand that with, um, uh, companies with employees of 50 or less are not required to do this anyways. Ms. Mr. Master, clear dichotomy of positions here, a clear difference here. Your thoughts on the I think this is a clear-cut case of not being able to see the forest through the trees. <laughs> you know, you're saying that there are numerous things about it that we should keep. Well, number one, this is a program that was, ju that was just pointed out by you. In Florida, the price alone for the average, um, uh, the average American is going up 25%. The price for Floridians, 19%. At its peak for Floridians, Do 36%. Do you propose, Mr. Mass, that we scrap it? And if we do, Republicans keep saying repeal and replace, but with what? I propose that we scrap it, that we repeal it, that we replace it. Specifically with what? I do think what? we keep some of those provisions, like uh, making sure that people have uh, mental health care, people can stay on some of those plans for a little bit longer if they're in school, uh, making sure that people with pre-existing conditions can find their way to some sort of risk pool to make sure that they do still find coverage. But beyond that, I think this is the number one fix that has to occur, and this speaks to why it is so unaffordable. It's the fact that the federal government is the one who is out there deciding what is an acceptable plan, what has to be inside of this plan in order to make it acceptable. If you want to make it better, let individuals choose what they want, whether that's high deductible or low deductible, whether that's an HMO, whether that's Mr. Perkins, a health savings account. And then Ms. Baldwin. I, I, I I'm sorry. I definitely think that the, it's not a good plan. The well, only then what thing do you replace it with? I would, repl I would scrap the whole thing. And, and replace and it replace specifically it. with what? I would make sure that we have the preexistence in there, I would make sure that stay up to the 20, age of 26. Children can stay on their Children parents' health plan until 26. They're 26 years old. And I would also make sure that mental health is a huge thing. We need to have that, that it's not stigmatized, that their mental, wealth, mental health awareness is there. But you would revert it back to private insurers only? Yes. I would think that it would have to sit and look at it together. Do you believe, Mr. Perkins, that we should revert it totally back to private insurance? No, I mean, first of all, Speaker Ryan has said it's not getting repealed. Or, 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 you cannot do that. You cannot, it would take several years to do this. But how do you deal with, with, a, with the millions of Americans that might be uh, getting treatment right now for cancer? They're on radiation, our children with childhood diabetes, and all these other issues. What are we supposed to say in six, from, six months from now? All that treatment, all that care just goes away? I, I have a solution for that. With, all, with all due respect. Um, you know, so what we also have to do is we have to understand why are insurance costs going up. We have to sit down with our insurance companies. We have to deal with the fact that this, in this country we're paying three to five times more for prescription drugs than anywhere else in the world. We have to deal with medical malpractice uh, insurance. We have to look at why the cost of insurance is going up to begin with. We have to sit down with our insurance companies. We have to find that happy balance between making a profit and providing the insurance that we need. But, but also if you just say let's just go back to the old system uh, and families are able to buy say an insurance policy policy for $500 and they're, and they're out of pocket, you know, 3500 the out of pocket for families, 10000 then then, you know, you might as well not have insurance because most of those families can't afford to pay that to begin with. Ms. Spalding, I want to begin with you. I want to begin with you on a different topic that critics say no politician is showing courage on, and it's about Social Security. So many in our community rely on Social Security or will with the baby boomer generation aging. Here's what the Urban Institute, a public policy think tank that has studied Social Security for more than 30 years said. The only real answer, quote, is to raise the payroll tax on everybody, high and low, owner, uh, high and low earners. We are not going to get solvency without raising the payroll tax. The only other way is to lower benefits. Are you willing to say, and you've been quoted as saying that you're going to tell people the truth about all things, are you willing to say that eventually high and low earners are going to have to look at a higher payroll tax and or lower benefits to create and keep Social Security solvent? Do you agree with that assessment by the Urban Policy Institute? I'm going to tell you what I agree with and what I think the well, solution is. Well, first, do you agree is. with their assessment? Uh, no. And I'm going to tell you what I agree with. Go ahead. What I think the solution is to that. Number one, I think that those who need, who does not need to collect it should not take it. That's where we can start off. That would help. Second of all, I do not think that... Where do they, you draw that line, first of all? Well, I think in, initially, I would have people choose. You know, we are, we are we're at a crisis right now. So whoever wants to help, they should play their part. And their part is if you don't need it, don't take it. And second of all, 
Congress needs to recognize they cannot keep borrowing money or spending money that's set aside for the Social Security. That's but, number but two. But the Policy Institute, and you did not specifically answer the question, they've been studying this 30 years. They say no politicians are willing to acknowledge that the trust fund will run out of money by 2034 and that unless we raise the payroll tax and or create a combination of benefit cuts, we're simply not going to get there. And you hear very few, if any, political leaders saying, I agree, that's the tough solution. And if that's the case, then how are you any different as a candidate? And I'll put the same question to these gentlemen on the other side of the break. How are you any different than the other candidates who've kicked this down the road? Well, because I think, listen, if we could, if they could come together and sit, they truly can, just like I mentioned, if they can stop borrowing from the Social Security, put places, listen, it is set up right now as a pyramid, the Social Security. That's a scheme. How yes? so? Because we're putting into the system that we haven't even reached there yet. We're paying I, I into it. I don't understand what you're saying. Okay, we are putting in. To, we're putting money in to for the future. We haven't. I'm not 65, so I'm not collecting. So I'm actually paying for somebody else, right? Correct. But in fact, that's been how Social Security was built at the start. That healthy workers right, were paying into that system. Right. But we need to change that system. How do you change it's that? Not, this is where the experts have to truly sit down and come together and come up with a better plan. We're going to pick up Social Security with our Democrat and Republican candidate on the other side of the break. We'll be back with more in just a moment. In Congressional District 18, we'll pick up where we left off on the other side of the break on Social Security. Mr. Perkins, again and again and again, we hear politicians saying they're going to talk truth to citizens and tell it like it is. National debt's essentially been off the table this election cycle, even though it's at 20, nearly $20 trillion and climbing. Entitlements like Social Security are one of the biggest drivers of national debt. So I'll put the same question to you that I did Ms. Spalding. Well-respected institutes almost universally argue that the trust fund will be out of money by 2034 and that sooner or later, Democrats and Republicans are going to have to agree on either payroll hikes or very severe benefit cuts. Do you agree that we're going to have to have a combination of tax hikes essentially, payroll tax hikes and or benefit cuts to create solvency for Social Security that a burgeoning group of baby boomers will soon need? I'm not talking about current retirees, but near or future retirees. Well, first of all, cutting benefits is not an option to me. So I, I do agree and support the plan of increasing the percentage that we, uh, that we take out of the employer's check and also that the employer has to match. I so do. You, you do agree with a tax hike for employees I, I, and employers? You can call it a tax hike. Well, it's I look, a payroll tax hike. Well, I'm going I'm to answer the question. Well, so yes. the, uh, you can, it, it is a payroll. It's a tax coming out of your payroll, but that's a trust fund. That is going into your future. That's your bank account for when you retire. So yes, it's coming out of your paycheck, but we can do this probably with about a 1%, one and a quarter percent uh, increase, and that comes from the employer and the, um, uh, and the employee. You've talked about raising benefits for uh, retirees. Absolutely. How do you do that when you already have a Social Security trust fund that's running out of money? Well, listen, I, we have to look at our seniors are struggling in this country, in this district, and across, across the United States. We're supporting, them, we're supporting our seniors with a SNAP food stamp program at $125 a month. This is costing our country billions of dollars over the year. So we're either going to pay it over here or we're going to provide the, our seniors right now with an increase uh, in their Social Security uh, benefit now. But where's the tough dialogue with the public? Uh, studies show that mm -hmm. a couple making, say, $45,000 apiece, had they retired in 2010, would have put about $622,000 into Social Security from their payroll taxes, but will draw out, if they live a normal lifespan, $922,000. Mm -hmm. Where does the tough talk begin where instead of promising everything, you tell people, we're going to have to tighten our belts, we may have to cut back and raise taxes as well. Are you willing to say that right. to people? You're talking no. about benefit increases at a time when the trust fund's set to run out of money. We're talking about benefit increases, Michael, to our most needy populations in this country, our seniors. And we have their, 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 their increases in their Social Security benefits are tied to an antiquated system, our CPI, that is not real with the increases of milk, groceries, and, and other things uh, essential. But, but, but we have lots of waste, fraud, and abuse in this country. Uh, we've got Medicare fraud that's costing this country billions and billions of dollars. Um, so I think collectively as a Congress, we have to make tough decisions and we need to fund an increase for our seniors today. It's something we must do. 
Randy brought up a very important point well, here, and he talks about the cost of living increase for people to go to Publix, for people to pay mm -hmm. their bills. He's been on record as saying over and over and over again that we need to print more money for this, print more money for that. And he obviously, as I've said before, doesn't understand the economics of inflation, that printing more money is what drives the, cups, the cost up for those people on fixed incomes. Uh, okay, so but, that given that, that, so, but, but given I, that, I, let's, I put the qu let's put the question to you as well, because you haven't answered it yet. I've outlined what the challenges are, and Republicans have kicked the can down the street as well. So how are you going to be any different on Capitol Hill unless... So the proposal, a 1% increase to the 7.65% payroll tax uh, on both sides, the employer and employee, I don't agree with that tax hike. I think You don't the, want to see any tax hike. I do not want to see a tax hike Even there. though the experts say you're going to have to have that. I believe the solution has to be economic growth. Uh, and economic growth, every one percentage point of economic growth is hundreds of billions of dollars to our economy. But that's been said for the last 30, 40 years, and the trust fund's continuing to run out of money. How is that a courageous stand? How is it politics different instead of politics as usual? Well, it's making sure that we do undertake politics policies that have economic growth. I'll give you one other important statistic right now. The, the federal budget was $1.8 trillion in 2000. Today the federal budget is nearly $4 trillion. So when we have people in Washington, D.C. telling us that there are not other places that we can cut, I think that that is one of the most false statements that anybody could possibly put out there. There are a lot of places that we can cut in order to grow our economy and, and make sure that these programs are strengthened. You know, Go ahead, Mr. Burton. It's briefly. very interesting that my opponent wants to lecture me on the economy when I've created thousands of jobs across this country, I built a very successful uh, business. I know what it's like to actually make payroll. I know what these deductions actually look like uh, because I've done them over the years. Um, I've developed small businesses, women-owned businesses. We've been recognized at the highest level from our government for our support and mentoring programs with service-disabled veteran companies. So he can continue with the talking points over the last 30 years or we, can, we have to make tough decisions. We have to make tough decisions of uh, Congress, or we can kick, keep kick, kicking the can down the road, which is what my opponent plans on doing. Briefly, on another topic, we've heard a lot about the fight for 15, many arguing in our country that uh, they deserve at least a minimum wage of $15 an hour. In some states, that's being adopted, not in Florida. Do you support the concept of this fight for 15, $15 an hour as a floor for minimum wage that in some states like California and New York is on its way or has been passed, Ms. Spaulding? I do support the minimum wage to, to be raised, definitely. To that amount? Um, the federal minimum right now is seven twenty-five In Florida, it's $8.05. Employers are going to argue if we have to raise the minimum wage, we may not be able to have as many people aboard working for our firms. Well, that, that so that what is do you say to concern. the employer who says, that, that worries me? That is a concern, I can tell you right now. Even I, I recently I saw an ad for a registered nurse for $16 an hour. And that's with a nurse manager with a bachelor's degree. So if they have a choice to hire someone that w has a degree with someone versus who just finished high school to pay that amount of money, they will choose to hire someone with a degree. What do you say to the that? employer who says, I won't be able to afford to have as many workers if I have to pay, let's say, a $15 an hour wage? What do you say specifically to that employer on the Treasure Coast or in the Palm Beaches? If they can't afford it, they can't afford it. But then that means less workers aboard. That is correct. So this is where I think that I don't necessarily think it needs to be $15 an hour. We have to look at there shouldn't be forced to pay $15 an hour. I don't necessarily think it should be 15 Mr. I Perkins, think it should be you've run a 15. business, as you've uh, said multiple times here. You've run a successful business. Do you mm -hmm. agree with the concept of raising the federal minimum wage somewhere between its current 725 all the way up to what we hear about in this fight, well, this fight for well, 15 Where do you stand as a businessman well, and the Democratic well, candidate? Unlike my opponent who says I support a $15 an hour, you asked me that question right after the primary. You challenged me that I, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton supports that, and what did I say? I said no. I said we have to look at that on a geographic basis. That's working with Republicans and Democratic members all throughout this country. And we have to look at, we can't solve one problem uh, w with a mandatory increase in minimum wage. We have to look at what the impact it's going to do on our small, small business. We don't want to solve one problem and create another problem a on the other fairness, side. In fairness, you're saying you want to do more research, but do you fundamentally support an increase in the minimum wage? I, again, geographically, that might be to $9, $10, $11. What I support is livable wages. I, I, I want to focus on livable wages in this country. Do you think in Florida your would-be constituents have enough of a livable wage? And in this community, for your constituents who you're talking to now, would you support an increase? Now, keeping in mind that the Florida minimum is above the federal minimum Correct. wage, but do you want and support an increase in the federal minimum wage in Florida for your constituents? I do support. Or would be constituents. I do. So, I, yeah, hopefully, my constituents. <laughs> I for do all support. Three of you. I do support an increase, but it has to be looked at 
and how it impacts our small businesses first and foremost. Mr. Mast. Just to be accurate about do, Randy's comments. Well, first, uh, do you on support? your interview, he said that he supported $13.50 minimum wage. That was to be Michael, perfectly Michael, accurate. You heard that's said. not what I said. I would go back and watch the video. Do you I do support, not support uh, <laughs> the expansion of, of the minimum wage? I think, yeah, you're going to get some people higher wages, but a lot of people are going to get pink slips as well if you, if you raise the minimum wage to this amount. And I think it's so very important that then? we bring this up. Two years ago at this time, when Patrick Murphy and Carl Domino were, dating, were, were debating the issue of minimum wage, uh, it was actually put to them by George Bennett, who's in the audience here this evening, that if they raised the minimum from the wage Palm Beach to Post, $10.50, shout out to George. Cents, <laughs> if they raised the minimum wage to $10.50 two years ago, that we would be at risk of losing half a million jobs in this country. So for people watching who could be your constituents, depending on how the vote goes, what do you say to them when they say, I can barely make it now, I need some kind of increase in the minimum wage? And look, you know, I've been in that place as well. So what do you say to them to specifically? The, when we had to tighten the buckle and, and, you know, make sure that there was a point in my life where my wife and I were eating eggs and potatoes nearly every single uh, meal for dinner, and I, would I was taking bananas to work. I know what it's like to have to tighten the belt in order to buckle down. I can you know, tell you that military privates don't make that much money, and, and they work essentially 24 hours yeah. a day. I want to I move Mike, things along but, you know, Mike, briefly. Uh, but th but this, this is important. My opponent wants to go park himself in Congress over the next 30 years, taking in 180 eighty thousand dollars a year whatever the number is so it's interesting to that he wants to make decisions that are not going to impact him and his family but the bottom line is we have to deal with with looking at minimum wage responsibly without com uh, causing problems for our small business and livable wages because if we don't we're spending billions of dollars over here as a government supporting programs food stamps other entitlement programs because our families cannot live so we're either paying for it over here or we're solving the problem over here. Want to turn? Want to turn to it? Want to turn to it? You don't have to be well, a you know, CEO to, to figure out here that my opponent twenty-five percent hikes in the affordable but, but care. Act. Briefly, one at a time, and one at a time, and briefly. You, Mr. Mass, first. I briefly. Just, you know, I don't need to be a CEO of a company to understand that twenty-five percent <laughs> hikes in the Affordable Care Act, that a fifteen-dollar an hour minimum wage, that tax hikes, that printing more money is going to destroy I'm, jobs I'm, and destroy I'm, this economy. I'm glad Final the Republican this Party. Topic. I'm glad the Republican Party sent him his talking points again. The fact of the matter is he's going to lecture me on jobs economy job creations tough decisions that you have to make in small businesses or business of any size um, I don't think so I know more about business economy banking than he'll learn in the next 30 years let's I want to turn to another topic immigration I want to turn to another topic immigration it's been a hot button the leader of the Republican nominee Donald Trump's talked about building a wall along the Mexican border it remains a hot button issue throughout this country any one of you could be called on if Mr. Trump were to win the election, to have a vote on building that wall. Do you support building that wall that, by some estimates, could cost 15 to $25 billion along our southern border, as Mr. Trump proposes? First, and you, you Mr. Mass. have been on record of talking about speak this. To your, you know, speak to it now. Uh, and I would be a proponent for making sure that we do find ways to secure that southern border. It could be Including a building barrier. a wall. could be a physical barrier like a wall. If it does, as I tell people, I think it should also have a wide gate because we are a nation of immigrants. There are other things that we need to do. But we need to look at why. And I'll give you this very, this very brief, syn brief synopsis of this. I have a number of friends that are still in special operations. One of my close friends in special forces just returned from a six-month deployment to South and Central America, where during their sixth month, they apprehended no less than half a dozen individuals from the Middle East trying to use traditional drug routes to gain access to the United States of America in order to conduct acts of terrorism. Here's what that is the threats that we're defending Here's against. what former Florida governor and GOP presidential candidate at one point, Jeb Bush, said. He said, the cost of such a wall is extraordinary. The terrain makes it impossible. It's a great soundbite, but not defensive in terms of a practical policy, and yet immigration and concern about secure borders is important. Your response to that from somebody who ran the state at the executive level for eight years? I don't think, uh, I don't see securing our border as impossible at all. You uh, talked now, about the cost a wall of it. is part of it. Beyond that, we have aerial assets such as drones. We have increased boots on the ground with our border patrol. There are a number of things that need to be put in place. Ms. Spalding, to accomplish if this. you were to win an election, that both Democrats and Republicans might be coming to you for a crucial vote on this. Do you support building a wall as Donald Trump well, envisions it? Well, I'm going to answer that question by telling you, first of all, I am an immigrant. And I can tell you this, that it takes anywhere from up to as much as 15 years to come to this country legally. So first, if we can start off by actually fixing that problem, the application process within our own country, that will help eliminate. Second, the wall will not solve the immigration problem, period. We, we, if we're going to spend $25 billion, employ our own people to the Border Patrol. Increase that. I think that would make more sense. That would put income into our own people instead of just the wall. Mr. Perkins, do you support a pathway to citizenship for some 11 million people 
by estimates who are here illegally but would like to have a chance to integrate into American society. Bottom line, do you support a pathway to citizenship? Well, for, look, first let me ask a question sure. that you asked my opponent who didn't sure. answer. No, I don't support building a wall. It's not practical. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. You've got environmental issues. You've got land issues. You've got which side of the wall do you put the, the, the or the river you put the wall. It's never going to happen. What I support is practical solutions. We need to secure our borders and we need to enforce our immigration laws, clearly, first and foremost. And yes, I do support a path to citizenship. I do not support a pathway why, to citizenship. Why not? I do look. Mm -hmm. I think if somebody's first venture into this country is one that is breaking our laws, uh, that does not bode well for for granting somebody uh, citizenship to this country. It, I am open to the conversation of a pathway to a legal work status for people here in the United States. Exceptions for ch uh, children born of parents who came here illegally. Exceptions for them. Well, if for somebody, citizenship, if somebody is born here, even of children here, mm -hmm. uh, even of parents that are here illegally, they are still legal citizens right. of the United States of America, and that's not something that I would change. How some somebody becomes a citizen of this country. Ms. Spaulding, pathway to citizenship, do you support it? I, I would definitely give them a way to contribute to the economy. I also think if a, a path of citizenship. A pathway to citizenship. Not to citizenship. I think they need to earn their way just like we did. There are a lot of people who are in line for, like I said, 10, 15 years waiting, and I think they need to go through the process as yeah. well. There's been a contentious debate about allowing more Syrian refugees into the country. 10,000 were allowed in during this last year, roughly up through September. The Obama administration, the outgoing Obama administration, would like to see that number increased. It's been a contentious issue on the campaign trail. You both know that, as do you, Ms. Spaulding. Mr. Perkins, do you support increasing the number of Syrian refugees coming into this country? You've heard the arguments from people like Mr. Trump who say we've got to stop until we get a better handle on who's coming in. Well, first, first of all, bottom line, do you support it? Then give me the nuance. Well, first of all, let me back to citizenship. I'm looking at a 7, 10, 12-year path to citizenship um, that has to be earned. But specifically to that question, um, we, have a, we, we have laws in this country right now, whether it's two and a half years, a vetting process uh, that we have for, for your question, Syrian refugees. What I would go back to is I go back to our FBI, our intelligence officials, our military officials, and ask them, is that two and a, two and a half years enough? Uh, do we need to look at expanding that to six months uh, or a year? I want to keep this country safe, clearly, first and foremost. But we also have to look at the children, whether it was a young boy on the beach or that young boy in the ambulance from mm -hmm. the uh, building that was bombed. And I would absolutely support a way to open our arms in this country for young children from around the world, including Syrian refugees, to come into this country with open arms. Mr. Mast. Uh, for several reasons, I don't support bringing in Syrian refugees into this country. It's been a big part of the conversation that there will be terrorists embedded into these groups. Beyond that, I think you have to look at reconstruction of Syria. And when we're looking to do something humanitarian for the people of Syria, I think it's important to realize that the most humanitarian thing that we can do for them is to give them a country that they don't have to flee. That is the best thing that we can do because 10,000 refugees is really a drop in the bucket compared to the millions of refugees that are actually displaced. And if you allow every person that you consider to be moderate in that country, a moderate Muslim, somebody that you wouldn't mind, uh, that you don't think is party to radical Islamic jihadist terrorism, if you allow all those individuals to leave that country, then who do you reconstruct around? We have more to talk about. I want to ask each of you briefly before we go to break. Uh, my colleague is Zora Rangel from well, TC I Palm. I want, to, I want to get to one other topic. We're not going to be able to cover everything in as much depth as we'd like. You can incorporate it into your answer if you'd like okay. in a moment, Ms. Spaulding. But I would like to ask, you've seen combat up close, of course, Mr. Mast. The question is, in order to fight ISIS, would you support if it ever came to that? The current administration says it does not want to put boots on the ground in forward combat operations. Would you support if it came to that boots on the ground, including U.S. boots on the ground, to fight the spread of terrorism and specifically ISIS, and I'd ask for a brief answer from each of you on that. First you, Mr. Mast. I believe we do have to support those boots on the ground. It is those foreign pipelines of terrorism that are inspiring pipelines of terrorism. Here Even in with the, the hornet's States nest, the critics say that could create? Well, we have to answer, how did that hornet's nest come to be? They could have been defeated at the time of the Arab Spring when President Obama was calling them the JV team. If we allow them to grow and expand further, this is going to become an even bigger problem. Brief answer, same topic. Ms. Spaulding. Um, yes, I do believe we can do put boots on the grounds. I think we need to have In combat operations. Navy SEALs. I think we need our sharpshooters to get in, get the job done, leave some behind to make sure it's done. But I also want to talk, now I want to talk briefly, about, this is important, briefly. briefly, with the Syrian. We can take other people in, in this country, yet mm -hmm. we have our veterans that are homeless on the street. I have a problem with that. I would think we need to take care of our own veterans that now we're talking about sending them to war to come back to PTSD and homelessness. 
That will not happen as long as I'm there. And we'll pick up that topic a bit on the other side of the break. Mr. Perkins, the same question about this concept of boots on the ground. The current administration says no way. Hillary Clinton suggests no, uh, no, let others like the Kurds lead that battle while we are in a support position. Your take. I am going to listen to our military officials, our NASA security experts, and it, they say if we need to put boots on the ground to keep this country safe here at home and fight terrorism around the world, I'm going to agree with them. My opponent and I don't differ on military issues. I want to talk uh, in a moment on the other side of the break about some of the acrimony in this campaign and some of your thoughts about what each of you'd like to do in the first two years as a freshman lawmaker should you be given that privilege. We're going to pick up that a bit more uh, because the public's been bombarded with these ads and I think it's fair to allow you to speak to that on all sides and some of your other thoughts about what motivates you as candidates. We'll do that on the other side of the break and we'll be back in just a moment. Back now with our candidates in the race for Congressional District 18 covering Martin, St. Lucie, parts of Palm Beach County. Mr. Perkins, as the Democrat here, do you respect Mr. Mast and his military service and Absolutely. his sacrifices? Absolutely, 100 percent. I've acknowledged that dozens of times. Let me ask and give you a chance because, as I said in an earlier broadcast today, you'd have to live on the moon or throw the TV into the intracoastal not to see the nasty ads on both sides of this campaign. <laughs> Before T.C. Palm at one point, you were sharply criticized when at one point you talked to him about receiving health care assistance from the VA, and some said the tone was as though, how do you deserve it? Also, when you said you're not man enough to stand behind your ads, some thought that was insensitive to somebody who's a double amputee because he was injured in combat. Your response to what many saw is a discordant, if not distasteful and insensitive set of comments. It's been a big part of the campaign ads. You know that. Please respond. Well, first of all, that's, that's not what I said. Uh, I was not begrudging Brian or any, any other veteran of the health care services and the things that, that they deserve and have earned for defending this country. Uh, what I was simply saying, it's not only about our veterans, it's also about our first responders, our firefighters, our paramedics, our, our law enforcement per personnel, but it's all of our families and everybody in this country who deserve the same access to adequate uh, medical uh, insurance uh, in, in this country, especially for mental health issues, especially for families with children, ones, children with loved ones with, uh, with, with, with uh, autism and other uh, uh, special needs. It's across the board about what's fair and balanced for everybody in this country. Do you, do you apologize here and now to Mr. Mast if, if he took the comments the wrong way or, or felt they were insensitive? Do you apologize to him on this debate stage? Well, first of all, if, if he took him that way, which that not, not what I was attending, but I would apologize to all veterans uh, for mis, uh, if, if that's what they thought. Mr. Mast, absolutely. Do you accept the apology? Uh, if he wants to say he's, uh, he apologizes, I accept that. But I think it is uh, naive to think that that is not what he meant. Uh, you failed to bring up one of the other comments that he made. It was his closing remark at that editorial board, where he uh, very argumentatively said, uh, "What about military service?" qualifies anybody to run for office and I made a point to answer that question last time that above all it's our sense of duty to America that we're willing to place our life above uh, above anything else political Mr. divide or, or, or political Mr. Perkins anything it, it, else it's, it's interesting how he wants to talk to me about attacks when right now as we sit here today the Republican Party and his outside spe uh, special interest in, in super PACs have spent 8.4 million dollars attacking me attacking my company and attacking my, my credibility uh, uh, to, to, to that extent. The fact of the matter is, and by the way, several of my uh, competitors, including one where he had a major fundraiser out on Monday night uh, in Davie at his multi-million dollar mansion, have given the RNCC over a million dollars to attack me. Let me ask you this. Uh, I want to ask again, uh, there, there's been enough of the uh, yeah. nastiness to go around on all sides. I want to put a question to you, Mr. Mast. And I also want to get to Ms. Spalding because I know veterans are near and dear to your heart and mental health as well. And I want to give each of you a chance to close. But Mr. Mast, you've been criticized in ads for supporting Donald Trump. Uh, you've heard about the allegations yeah. involving women, the comments about minorities, the list goes on and on. You're a military man early on in the campaign. He said he liked people who weren't captured, a reference to John McCain, who heroically endured six and a half years as a POW. Do you still wholeheartedly support Donald Trump? I do not excuse any comment that Donald Trump has made or any, any 
poor action that Donald Trump has ever conducted. And I've been very clear but about that. But do you still that. endorse him wholeheartedly? But he, if were the election held tomorrow, he would still have my support. And I, I want to ask you one other question, Mr. Perkins. You've been criticized at your company, Ashbrit. Uh, you've seen the ads. You've heard the criticisms uh, that, they, that you've overcharged, that you've made millions off people's misery, that uh, after Katrina, the work wasn't up to par. You've seen the ads. You've heard the criticisms. Well, Here's your chance to respond. I'm, I'm going to respond. Right now, we have we have 350 plus municipal contracts around this county. We have uh, country. We have 26 uh, state contracts. We're one of four contractors uh, at the federal level for major catastrophic response. But let's bring it home to this district. As I sit here tonight, we're currently performing uh, services in Palm Beach County, Martin County, St. Lucie County, and 42 other uh, municipalities from uh, Volusia County to uh, to Charleston, South Carolina. Now, Martin County in this district. They've seen these ads that go back to Katrina, they go back to Sandy, this nonsense with the Broward County School Board, but yet Martin County, right here in this district, six months ago put out a request for proposals, a bid, where t over multiple companies from around this country submitted on it. We were not the low price, but they selected us six months ago and, and awarded us a five-year contract uh, that we've been working, and we're currently working on that contract in Martin County. And as, you far said, as, as far as Donald Trump. Let me, ask, let me ask you one, and then I want to move to Ms. Spalding, and then finally to Mr. Mass. You said to me when I talked to you last time, first of all, you moved into the district mm -hmm. late in the game, registered as a Democrat, Correct. very late in the process, and you said on camera to me, said it was a tough choice whether I go in as a Democrat or a Republican. Are you more Republican than Democrat? Where do you really stand with that? And to people who say he's new to the district and this was not idealism, it was opportunism, what do you say to the residents and the voters of District 18? Well, first of all, both, both my opponent and I are, are new to the district. Let's just let's be That's uh, true. fair and transparent on that. That's true. Uh, what I am is I'm a moderate problem solver, but I will never waver on choice, equality. Um, I will always defend Planned Parenthood. My opponent wants to, wants to deny a woman her right to choose. Uh, he wants to go backwards on equality. Uh, he wants to defend, uh, defund uh, Planned Parenthood. But back to Donald Trump for a second. Let me give you some statistics. Briefly, because one, we need to get to Ms. Spalding and our one time's in, running one out. One in three girls, one in five boys, one in five of our children that ever go on the Internet, and a significant percentage of our special needs and developmentally disabled community will be the victims of sexual assault by the time they're 18 years old. Yet he still, uh, still defends and supports a man for president, for president, who, who vilifies women, who ranks them from one to ten. We have enough problems with our girls and our young women in this country Perkins, that suffer from body image to, issues, to, we need to wrap pressure, up and allow, eating disorders, Ms. Spalding, uh, I eating disorders, self-harming, suicide. I also have to look okay. at the clock here. So, Ms. Spalding, uh, your background, you were in the United States Navy. Yes. Uh, you've also a master's background in education, nursing, and the like, and your specialty in education, I should say. And I know that's near and dear to your heart. As you listen to the Republican and Democrat, and when you look at a community with so many independents, why are you ultimately the better candidate? What drives you and what should drive voters to say you're the choice over the Republican or Democrat here? Brief, uh, relatively briefly, but let's give you a little time to expand on that Well, within our time constraints. Without a, without a matter of a doubt, I owe no one anything mm -hmm. other than the people. I'm not backed by the Republicans, not backed by the Democrats, or no special interests. What would be the chief issue that would motivate you in Congress? I'll tell you what it is. Number one, we must do something about our veterans and our young people. Mm -hmm. Because if they come back to absolutely nothing, then the ones that are here now that wants to go voluntarily are choosing not to do that anymore. So if you could do one thing in your first two years, you've talked to me about this before, about mental health, veterans. Yes. If you could accomplish one thing and one thing only in two years in Congress, what would it be? My main thing right now is our veterans. I've worked at the VA hospital and I see the suffering and I see the homelessness. I see how the young people, because there are young veterans mm -hmm. who may not be disabled, but they're still struggling in general. And we have to take a look at that. We can't keep bringing in other people without looking at our own people first and taking care of them. Mr. Mast, at the end of the day, uh, in a tough race, uh, what do you say to people, uh, and what do you say to Mr. Perkins and Ms. Spalding about the tone and tenor, and what do all of you say to your constituents 
about how you're going to work with others when a campaign like this has been so tough, but, and ultimately, what's your reason why you think you're best capable of serving District 18? You know, above all, it's something very ideological. It's that I care. It's that I've always cared about this community, about this country, about the, the people across the breadth of this country. I care enough to give everything to include the last beat of my heart for this place. And if there's one thing and only one thing you could accomplish in two years, as a freshman legislator, that may even be optimistic, but if you were to win, what would be the one thing you'd want to end two years and say, I did that in Congress? Well, to give you one local and one national, it would be uh, nationally, uh, certainly reform of the Department of Veterans Affairs, making sure that my peers from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, that they have access to anytime, anywhere care, and locally making sure that I'm on the right side of fighting for our water issues. Same question to you. If you could achieve one thing in those two years, we have 30 seconds, Mr. Perkins. Well, first of all, you have to be able to work together, and I've proven that at a very high level successfully in business. Unlike my opponent, who calls Democrats evil, uh, calls uh, the state they need to be exterminated in Congress, but what I want to work on, uh, by default, you have me in business. I understand business and the environment. Uh, with all due respect, better than my opponents do. Uh, but I really care deeply about mental health issues in this country. Early childhood intervention of, of Mr. Perkins, anxiety and depression. We'll have to, the we'll, opioid ed epidemic that's destroying we'll the have very to leave fabric there. of this we, country that we live in. Thank you. And I apologize to all of you. The, the clock uh, waits for no one. We thank you, Mr. Mast, Ms. Spaulding, thank Mr. You. Perkins. Thank you very much. There's no bigger obligation than to be involved in our democracy. All three of you are doing that as candidates. You had some of your family and friends. They may applaud now. And of course, do your part and get out and vote. It's the greatest privilege any of us can exercise. You're, you can applaud your candidates now. We thank you so much for joining us to give you a little bit more of the flavor for the candidates in this Congressional District 18 race. Again, I'm Michael Williams with WPTV News Channel 5. Thank you for listening to them. Thank you for joining us. We wish all of you a great evening and a great weekend.